Okay, I think we're live. I think something's happening right now. I think we may be talking to other people, or at least I think so. I think that this is the first episode of the Bintel Society, and because of technical issues and uh, and whatnot, we we might not be perfectly live just yet, but. I think we're out on the channels now, so let's start talking. My name is Dylan O'Donnell from the Byron Bay Observatory, and today uh, we have Rami Mandau from Space Australia. Say good day, Rami. Hey, Dylan, how's it going? It's going really well. Rami and I were actually uh, co-students together at Swinburne University studying astronomy, uh, but Rami has gone on to, uh, he's doing his master's of astronomy, which is um, amazing. It's uh, He's a far better man than I am. So we're going to rip through some of these uh, images that you guys have sent Bintel and we're going to talk about them uh, because really this is what we do. This is, we, we love actually, some people like the process of fishing and the process of tinkering. Uh, I actually like the fish at the end of the day. I actually like to see the results. So uh, Jack, if I could get you to pull up image number one on the stream, which is by Hamish Barker. So hopefully the image is up on the stream. I need Jack to give me a sing signal of some sort to <laughs> let me know if the image is live on the screen because I can't actually tell. Uh, Jack, is that image live? Uh, okay, cool. So this is a spectrum of the Homunculus Nebula. Homunculus is a, uh, is a, it's a kind of like an envelope that happens around the Eta car star. Now, a lot of you might be looking at this photo going, is this an astro photo? This is the worst photo I've ever seen in my life. And uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking that, but it's actually a spectrum grading. So what Hamish is doing here is he's actually uh, taking the spectra of the, the light that comes out of the Humunculus Nebula, out of Eta Car, so that he can give us the absorption lines that we see here. Uh, and I'm gonna let Rami speak more to what that actually means, Rami. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. I, I just, you know, you, you know, I actually love spectrums. And I try to get it as much as I can as well. Um, I didn't actually know about this star until last night. I had to go look it up, but it's actually quite interesting. Um, what I actually found, <coughs> excuse me, what I actually found about the star was um, really amazing. That you know, it's got this envelope around it, as you said, and it's actually got light that's actually passing through it, um, and it's exciting some of the hydrogen atoms, which is, it gives us that bright, uh, that bright line that Hamish has captured there in that image. And then right next to it is the absorption spectra from a bigger envelope, a, um, a little bit further away from the star itself. And that's absorbing some of the light that's passing through it as well. So, you know, it's a B-class star. It's a quite a big star, quite a big hot star. It's releasing um, lots of these photons that are actually interacting with the surrounding nebula. And it's giving us that beautiful, uh, you know, co-joined absorption and emission spectra that's right there. So it's looking really good. Yeah, it is a really bizarre star. Eta Car is one of these candidates that we think might go supernova at some point. It became one of the brightest stars in the sky in the 1800s. It is really bizarre. I hope it does blow up in our lifetimes. In the meantime, we can study the star like this using using uh, its spectra, uh, but it is worth amazing. And it's got these uh, sort of like shooting rays of light coming out of it. It's one of the weirdest stars in the sky that you can see. Uh, now, Hamish took this, uh, basically without a telescope. I'm not sure if you have the setup there, Jack, but it is uh, on a star adventure mount. So he's he's tracking it uh, with a mount. He's using a ZWO um, 1600 mm with a Nikon lens adapter. So he's basically got this camera attached directly to a lens. It's a really cool little setup here and a really great way to do a bit of science from the backyard. Uh, I yep, okay. So. What I just said there about the little camera hooked up to something that's not a telescope, it's hooked up to a Nikon lens, is for this next picture of Great Karina. It's a narrowband image of Karina and the Running Chicken Nebula. Can you uh, get that up for us so we can see this image? Now, this is a hugely wide field. You can see what I mean about not using a telescope here is actually uh, use just the Nikon lens tracking the sky on the Star Adventure amount, which allows like an equatorial rotation. So it's tracking the sky equatorially and allows you to take this really these nebulas showing up everywhere, but you get all this dark dust and you can see that normally what we would perceive to be like a void of space or the darkness of space is really brought out in this particular image from Nick. So he can talk about uh, what we're looking at here. 
Yeah, look, this is a, again another great image, and I do love that wide angle as well. Um, you know, the, the Carina Nebula is so big in the sky, it's so beautiful. It's you know 460 light years in diameter. It's it's pretty massive. Um, so just looking at the Carina side of things, first of all, um, you know, what you're seeing here is, you know, some of the, the actually the Eta Carina star itself is actually one of the biggest stars we know of. It's a, it's a star system. We think there's two of them in there, maybe three. Um, it's roughly about 100 to 150 solar masses. Um, and they're these big O and B class stars, which are the biggest and hottest stars you can get out there in the universe. And what's going to be really cool is, um, and I, I like you, Dylan, I actually hope this blows up as well because I want to see one of these things in my lifetime. But, um, yes. you know, when this does blow up, this will actually become a big black hole as well. And if there's two stars there, eventually the second one's going to blow up and that's going to become a black hole. And at some point in the future, someone's going to be able to measure some gravitational waves from it as those stars start <laughs> orbiting each other. So it's going to be pretty cool. Brilliant. Now, that, that is cool. Jack, if you could go over to uh, number three here is by Angel Lopez Sanchez. And now Angel is a friend of ours, actually. Uh, he works at, uh, is it AAOO, AAO, uh, yep, Ramin? that's right, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and what I like about Angel's work is that, I mean, this guy has access to some of the biggest telescopes in the world. And he actually is a professional astronomer doing big scientific stuff. But recently he's come into doing astrophotography from his backyard, like the rest of us, which beautiful photo here of the Rosette Nebula. Now, Rosette is a quite a wide target, uh, but it is, uh, compared to the other stuff, it's actually quite faint. So to get the Rosette looking as bold and as beautiful as that, you know, big rosy image uh, typically looks, uh, you do have to do a good integration. You do have to get some some good long subs on it and uh, and really process it quite nicely, which he's done fantastically. A couple of view of this in uh, what looks to me tell natural images because you get the uh, separation between the blue and the orange stars here. I think Angel is doing a fantastic job here. Uh, Rami, do you want to say anything about this particular target? Yeah, look, Rosetta is actually stunning and this photo is stunning and I saw it on Twitter as well the other day and I thought, wow, what a beautiful photo. Um, and again, those big sort of O and B class stars in the center are really shaping what's that bubble, sort of the carving out that bubble inside the Rosetta Nebula there. Um, but as he said, you know, this, his, I think from the notes I saw that um, Angle was actually using uh, some couple of different filters to make this most, uh, you know, as, as natural as it, as it would be. And what we can see there is those different color stars. And, you know, those different colors tell us a lot about what's, what's happening at the star. They tell us about its, um, its temperature, and then by measuring its temperature and luminosity, we can start doing different things with it. Like we can start learning about its mass and its radius and, you know, if, if what kind of energy it gives off and if it can have planets around it. So just by looking at a star's color, you can tell a lot, actually, a, a heap of uh, amount of information. Brilliant. Uh, have I been pronouncing it wrong? Is it Angle, not Angel? Uh, I, I call it Ankel. Ankel. Ankel, yeah. Okay, good. Sorry, sorry, Ankel. Um, <laughs> Let's go to the next photo. It is by Lachlan Wilson, who writes that this is his first post here and he's looking forward to getting some feedback. He's only 15 years old and just getting started with this awesome activity. Uh, it looks like he's done 22 frames of 90 seconds using the Star Adventurer and a Canon 1000D, which has been the lights just coming straight into the sensor. And he's using a Canon wide field images and he's taken a big swath of the sky uh, I can't, I can't recognise the area, and I'm trying to find. It says I could, I could, I could probably jump in and tell you that NGC six one five two and the S NOR cluster. Uh, give us some, give us some feedback on what we're looking at here, Rami. Yeah, look, it's it's actually. Um, I had a little bit of it last night as well. It's actually um, the reason why we're seeing so many stars is because. Uh, Lachlan's taking a photo of a really dense part of the Milky Way structure, the Milky Way band, the galactic band. Um, and it's, it's actually quite a beautiful photo because, you know, everywhere you look in this photo, there's stars. And, and I zoomed in as much as I can on Stellarium and there were still more and more stars. Um, so it is definitely part of the busy, a busier part of the sky. Uh, it did remind me of something called Olber's Paradox, um, you know, which uh, we talk about in cosmology. It's about, you know, why is the sky dark at night? Um, doesn't look like it in this image because we're looking at a very dense part of a, of, a, of a star. But if you look elsewhere in the sky, you wouldn't see this. And uh, there's a bit of a paradox around it. And it's because the age of the universe just here, which is why the sky is dark at night. But it's certainly not presented here in uh, Lachlan's wonderful photo. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I actually really like uh, this idea of just 
pointing your telescope wherever or pointing your camera lens wherever and just trying stuff that isn't the you know typical recognizable uh, areas that we see over and over again and uh, Lachlan's noted that he's uh, carved out this giant capital T in the sky. I think you're doing a great job Lachlan and welcome to the hobby at 15 years of age. Uh, as we all know you will never have any money ever again so good luck with that. Uh, we're going to move on to number five by Stuart Wilson. This is, no, this is Bintel and this is uh, Southern Hemisphere stuff and Bintel uh, does uh, support astronomers in Australia and New Zealand. I do love seeing a Northern Hemisphere target and the, the uh, cloud uh, sorry, selfie is just stunning. Uh, he's, he writes that he's taken this from his cloudy and light polluted backyard in central Scotland with four hours of five minute exposures. So again, this sort of exposure time reminds me of the Rosette Nebula where it is actually a, a faint target and you do need that integration time to pull out the details. Uh, he's using a RBO Horizon 72 ED refractor on a Skywatcher AZGTA mount. And again, a modified Canon uh, to let in all of that light onto the, onto the sensor there. So this looks like a, a great job to me. You see that typical red hydrogen glow. And Rami, what can you tell us about this image? Um, look, like you, first of all, I actually love seeing uh, Northern Hemisphere sort of uh, targets because we can't see them from down here. So I've always wondered about them. I've recently I realised I can get Andromeda from here in Sydney, but that's <laughs> another story. Um, look, again, those O and B class stars in the centre, they're, they're just really sort of amazing structures. And we're kind of lucky that we see them now because they don't last very long. They're only around for a few million years. So we're kind of seeing them while they exist, which is kind of, uh, kind of beautiful in, in its own way. Um, I actually think this one looks like a little, that looks like nothing like it. Look, I mean, these, these stars, they produce a lot of um, high energy photons and high energy uh, radiation. And, and effectively, if there was a planet nearby or if there was any, anything that lived nearby, if those any, that high energy photons, they kind of rip away the molecules and break up the molecules of, of, of those structures and those, and those features. And effectively, they kind of ruin life. So while it's pretty to look at for us, it'd be pretty hostile to be around them, um, you know, if you were close to them. Very cool. The next image, uh, Jack, if you could pull it up, is from Mary Toki, who is sending us an image of the Eta Carina Nebula. So again, it's sort of Carina season right now, which is why we're seeing a lot of these Carina images. And uh, Mary has taken this one with a Skywatcher S3 White Nebula for nothing. It's great because it looks amazing, but it's also just huge, uh, which makes it a perfect beginner target if you're in the Southern Hemisphere as well. I really like uh, what uh, Mary's done here. We can't see what those what that color combination is. Maybe it's the Hubble palette or I'm not sure, uh, but it, it is a really good looking nebula. It's so hard to get a bad photo of the Carina nebula. It's, I love Carina. I, my, I even called my car Carina. It's uh, the nickname for it, but I love the way uh, the oxygen in this one is sort of mapped to blue. It just looks really cool. Uh, Rami, do you want to give us a little bit more about Carina today? Yeah, sure. And look, as, as you said, it's, it's such a wonderful target. But one thing I want to photos, fo focus on on Mary's image, um, which I really liked in this image, was uh, right next to the Eta Carina star behind uh, the much more brighter sort of background nebula that um, silhouettes it when we're looking at it as well. And the interesting thing about that sort of the Keyhole Nebula is that in, in the last 200 years, we've seen changes happen to that because of the massive star that's next, next to it. So, um, you know, for that, Rami. Uh, I really like the way we're sort of bouncing between me just saying, oh, that's a pretty photo. And then Rami coming in there and just slamming us with some science. It's fantastic. Uh, now the next image, uh, you could pull up uh, number seven, uh, Jack there. It's uh, by Jessica Carlisle. And she's bringing us an image, which this, I, I don't know, it may be my favorite in the bunch. I really love this pencil nebula. The pencil nebula is a really small, really faint sort of dainty target uh, off in an unassuming region of space that is, it's really hard to get really well. There's a lot of stuff around it, but it's all just so fragile. It's uh, sort of floating with this wispiness out in space. And to get this, uh, this result, it's got this kind of blue tinge against the red hydrogen glow of space. It's, pr uh, it's, it's probably a little bit too tilted to the red here, which she admits in, in the description she sent to us. Uh, it is a bicolor image in hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen. And uh, she's going to try and get some more data on this one. She's using the Vixen AX103S, the QHY163M and filter wheel and a uh, ZWO120MM guide camera. 
she is doing really well uh, to get this sort of data. It's uh, approximately eight hours of data and she's getting more, which is uh, it's very ambitious because it is a very faint target, but she's doing so well with this. Uh, Rami, can you give us a little bit more insight into the Pencil Nebula? Yeah, so, and, and I, I actually really love this one as well. And I'm probably going to show my age here a little bit, but it does remind me of something out of that Tron Legacy movie. It's just the colours are so <laughs> bright and vivid and so wonderful. So I actually really love this. Um, look, the Pencil Nebula is a little small sort of section of a larger uh, supernova remnant known as a Vela Nebula. Um, now, the Vela Nebula itself, uh, or supernova remnant, I should say, is a result of a very massive star that exploded about 11 to 12,000 years ago um, in that region and sort of puffed off all these outer layers and they're, they're sort of expanding away at quite a fast speed. Um, and we know this because, uh, you know, a couple of years back, um, we actually found a pulsar inside the Vela Nebula, it's called the Vela Pulsar. It, it is the brightest pulsar in the sky. It rotates at, you know, at something like 11, um, uh, 11 times a second, which when you translate that to, when you look at the circumference and you translate that to its actual spin rate, it comes to about 2.4 million kilometers an hour. That's how fast its equator is spinning. So it's pretty fast. Uh, it is the brightest pulsar in the sky. It gives off optical light, it gives off X-ray light, it gives off gamma ray light. Um, and if you've ever had a chance to hear what a pulsar sound like, especially the Vela pulsar, that's actually you know in, the, in, this, in this remnant, um, it kind of sounds like a diesel engine or you're standing right under a helicopter blade. So it's really <laughs> cool. Um, so this is, a, this is a really, really wonderful image of something that explains uh, to us, you know, something that's happened, something big that's happened in the past. So it's, it's, I love it. I actually really do like this one. Yeah, I only discovered this target a while ago. It's, it's such a huge region. And what we see, you can almost sort of backtrack it and see the beginning of the explosion from the progenitor. And you can see these, these ripples out into space. And Pencil Nebula sort of sits on the edge of one of these ripples. But that whole area, if you can use a camera lens or something to get, get it all in, is really spectacular. And I started diving into just small sections of it to get small edges of this. Uh, I mean, it doesn't look like a bubble anymore. It looks all quite bulbous and, and ripply. It's uh, really amazing. The Vela uh, Omicron, I forget what it's called, supernova remnant, uh, really amazing. Um, Let's move on to image number eight by Carlos Taylor, who is showing us, I didn't realize how easy it is to get because it is just as big and just as bright almost as some of the other big ones like Carina. And it's, a, it's a further along, uh, further east than Carina, but it is a spectacular part of the sky to capture. And it's called the Fighting Dragons of Ara, where you can see these two dark nebulas sort of reaching out towards each other and you see this big, expanse of light heading upwards uh, that shows the glow of the um, excited uh, ionized hydrogen uh, upwards from the clouds there, this amazing star forming region. He's taken this with a triplet refractor, a sharp star 61 EDPH2, a Skywatcher NEQ6 Pro, and a ZWO 183MM Pro using off-axis guiding and uh, filters. He's using hydrogen, oxygen, and uh, sulfur. So it's a narrowband shot, uh, which you can you can process in many different ways to get all sorts of different color regions. But to get this, it almost looks like a Hubble, Hubble palette kind of result. Uh, you see it's very green, but a lot of that green comes from the hydrogen. You know, it's such a hydrogen dominant image. Now I can see, uh, Carlos, that you've cropped this into a square. And I know what that means. It means that you've got some vignetting on the edges because I do this myself as well. It's There's no shame in cropping. I do it all the time. Often when we're taking astrophoto uh, astrophotography, we uh, sort of crop out the edges because you get rough bits along the edge, you get coma. And this is a great thing to do, especially for social media, because this sort of format works for um, Instagram and Facebook and stuff. It, it sort of pops up really nice and large on those sorts of vertical screens. So no harm in cropping off those uh, uh, dud corners and really focusing on the good stuff in the middle, which is where all the good stuff will be in your image. Uh, Rami, can you give us a little bit of insight? into Carlos's NGC 6188. Yeah, so it's, it's a beautiful image again. Um, you know, I used to call this one the Game of Thrones nebula because it does look like those two <laughs> dragons that are fighting each other. Um, it's, 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 look, this image is stunning. It actually looks like a painting to me. That's how good it is. So um, what I actually really loved about this image as well was that it featured um, NGC 6164 down the bottom right. It's a little sort of that little feature down the bottom. Um, 
Now that's actually a binary system and that contains a couple, a couple of other massive overstars as well. But the special thing about that system um, is that it's only like a couple of million years old. It's only five or six million years old. So it's not very old astronomically at all. And it's such a big sort of system and such a, you know, it's giving off so much energy so quickly that it's only going to last for another five or six million years. So, you know, that's definitely a supernova target um, in the pretty distant future for us, but not too distant future astronomically. Um, and I love those sort of the two layers of those nebulas around that sort of NGC 6164. You've got that sort of inner layer, which is quite bright. If you go further, a little bit further out, you've got that more faint layer, uh, which is a previous outburst from the star itself. So, uh, yeah, really spectacular. Very cool. Uh, now we're going to move on to uh, an image by Luke Shepard here. This is an image I've been seeing pop up all over the place uh, because I'm, you know, obviously it's subscribed to different astro groups and channels and things like that, but it is one of my favorite regions of space. Uh, you can see in his processing of this that he's really pulled out the dark nebula in the Corona Australis molecular cloud, dark molecular cloud. It is such a stunning part of space. It's just got so much going on. I think the framing is uh, really strange here. I've never seen it framed in this particular way where he's concentrating on that big dark cloud out in space there. Now, normally we think about uh, nebula as being like sort of star forming regions, but I think there's a, a little more going on here. Yeah, photographically, there is this weird feature in the middle. Uh, they, they're starting to call it Yoda's walking stick because it looks like it sort of looks like Yoda with his little green head there. And, and there is there is a lot of green in this image, uh, which is not, not a star color. It's more coming out of the dust and the sort of carbon monoxide brown that we've, we've got there. Uh, and that you can see that little swirl in the middle is what people are calling Yoda's walking stick here. I just love this image. Uh, Rami, can you give us a bit of detail on what we're looking here? Looking at here. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Luke's image is amazing. I too love it. And, and this is a, a really nice example that shows um, the different kinds of things that are happening with nebulae um, and the way that light interacts with nebulae, especially. So down the bottom, you've got that really nice reflection blue features down on, sorry, reflection nebula down the bottom, which are reflecting blue light off them as they scatter the light away from them. But if you look at, um, you know, Yoda's walking stick as well, um, what, you, what you'll see is, um, it blocks out most of the light from the stars behind it, but some of that, some of that, some of the stars are big enough and bright enough for them to shine their light through. But effectively, their light goes red because you know, it's, all the blue light is scattered. So, you know, I start thinking to myself, what does this thing look like from the other side? If you could stand on the other side, would that side all be beautiful blue and Yoda's stick would be nice and blue as well there? So, it is actually quite a really cool feature. Yeah, and I think from what I understand, which is not much, uh, we we do see you know those big blue reflection stars there. But we don't see um, we don't see the star formation like we do in say Orion, where you got the big red and purple kind of gl glowing new stars. Most of the new stars here, I believe, are hidden by this dark cloud. So there is stuff going on inside it, and it is an early stage. Maybe in uh, a lot of well, a long time from now, we will see uh, this this nebula transform into something like the Orion Nebula. But for the moment, uh, we can only peer through these dark clouds with, with different kind of radio frequencies and, and X-ray to get to the heart of what's going on in here. But we do believe there is a lot of star formation going in underneath those uh, dark clouds. A really fascinating target and a, a great image. Thank you for, for sharing that with us, Luke Shepard. Uh, we're gonna move on to number 10 here, which is, and this is, has been in no particular order. We just love seeing all these photos and love talking about them. This one's by Paul Mayer. Uh, now he's taken a, an image of the Southern pinwheel, pinwheel, which I believe is M83. Uh, this is one I've been trying myself, but he's doing it with a 12 inch F5 Newtonian telescope and a Losmandy G11 mount and a Canon. And he's done uh, about four hours over two nights. And I've got to say, uh, I mean, he's doing it in color, but he's getting a, for a, for a one shot color camera, he's getting a great amount of detail. He's resolving, uh, a lot of the structure of the spiral arms of this galaxy, it's just turning out really quite well. I've been trying this myself and I have to say it's its harder than it looks. Uh, with galaxies, you are shooting not in narrow band, you're definitely doing broadband. So the ambient light around you, light pollution matters. It's really hard to resolve a galaxy like this really well. And he's got not only the structure, but we're seeing these kind of red, uh, gems of the, the nebulas in another galaxy glowing through those arms where you see the galaxy is sort of having these 
tidal swirls that are causing star formations and these different star populations through it. It's really one of the one of the one of the jewels of the southern hemisphere, this particular galaxy. And we, we don't have as many cool galaxies as uh, there are in the uh, northern hemisphere, although that's debatable depending on how you like your galaxies. If you like them kind of messed up, we've got a lot of weird messed up ones down here. Uh, but this is a classic looking spiral galaxy. I really like it. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Rami to tell us a little bit more about what we're seeing in this galaxy. Yeah, I absolutely love this one. And Dylan, you know, I've been trying to photograph this one myself um, and pretty much not doing as good a job as this, but effectively it's such a big, beautiful target, especially for amateurs like me. And, you know, it's pretty high in the sky at the moment. So it's a good target to get at the moment. Um, Look, the thing I love about this galaxy are those, you know, those, those bright blue sort of star clusters that circle the entire galaxy. And if you look at a Hubble image of this photo, of this galaxy, you can actually zoom in to see those individual big bright blue stars as well. That's how, you know, that's how prominent they are. Um, and they're sort of ionizing those pink regions, which are basically the star forming regions. And, you know, they're creating all that nice gas out there as well. Um, but what I actually really love about this is those dark features. And if you look at the galaxies uh, in detail, you can see the, the spiral arms following these sort of stringy, snaky kind of uh, dark features as they sort of wrap around the galaxy. And if you zoom in um, on the core region, even in Paul's photo, um, you, know, you, can, you can see that one of those um, spiral dark features actually wraps over the top of the core. So it's, it's, it's actually really, really wonderful. And um, I was doing a little bit of reading about this galaxy because I'm kind of obsessed with that at the moment. And it's actually had six supernova in the last, you know, 100 years or so. So uh, hopefully there'll be another one soon. As you can tell, I'm pretty much keen on a supernova. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. And I believe like um, we take it for granted that these spiral structures exist at all. But there is some uh, debate in the scientific community about how these sorts of structures work even. Like if a galaxy was twisting like that, wouldn't it twist itself into an infinite by the spiral structure? And that is still stuff that we're still, pardon the pun, unraveling today. Um, now we're running out of time, so I'm gonna just uh, talk about one last image. We've done 10 already, but there is one honorable mention here, which is the Orion Nebula from Kenny Chan. Now this is um, by no means the greatest image at all, but Kenny, uh, if you're watching, I can tell the excitement that you felt when you saw this pop up on your camera. When I was getting started with uh, astrophotography, it was it was sort of bizarre to me that we could point our cameras or our telescopes to the sky and get back these clouds from space. And shooting Orion is one of the first things a lot of us do. And to see color and structure and this, this cloud of activity coming from space is really exciting. Uh, so I can tell he's excited because he's already using it for his uh, wallpaper on his desktop computer, which is, trust me, it's what we all do. In fact, I'm considering changing my official title to professional desktop wallpaper maker, because that's where a lot of the images end up. Uh, Rami, is there anything you'd like to say about this image before we say goodbye for the day and episode one? Uh, as you said, you know, Orion's such a great target, it's such a beautiful target. It's, uh, you know, the, the closest, I think it's the closest star forming region that's actually near us. Um, you know, it's, uh, you've got those big sort of four trapezium stars and so four or five trapezium stars in the center and they're sort of pushing away part of the gas and restructuring the actual Orion Nebula. Um, if you get a chance to go check out a Hubble um, animation kind of video that they NASA have made about this, because you get to fly through the Orion Nebula in 3D, because it does show you the uh, structure from different angles, but also shows you how uh, some stars are moving so fast through the cloud that they've got a little bit of a bow shock around them. And so uh, that's kind of cool to see as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, the Orion Nebula is great, so I actually love it. Yeah. I'm not sure that Jack was able to get the image on the stream there, maybe because it wasn't in his um, his document. I'll just see if I can uh, share that. Give me a moment. No, I can't share it. Um, sorry, Jack, if, if you do get a chance to pop it up on the screen, but if not, uh, thank you everyone for watching this, whether you're watching it live or replay, because this is episode one, we just sort of wanted to do a dry run and see if the format worked. If it did work, please let us know in the comments, either on Facebook, or on YouTube. Uh, hopefully you've seen this replay and it wasn't too much of a car crash. If it was a car crash. I hope you uh, couldn't look away because if you couldn't, we'll be back soon for another, hopefully episode two with uh, more fantastic guests like Rami Mandau from Space Australia who's really given some great insight into the images we've been looking at.